welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and together we will discuss vignettes, have conversations, think deep thoughts, and continue to grow together as spiritual beings longing to be more fully alive in our human experiences. I'm so glad you're here and thank you for joining me. Something to think about today. I believe that my best ideas have not even been thought yet. I believe my best ideas have not even been thought yet. She believes that her best ideas have not even been thought yet. Do you believe that your best ideas haven't even been thought yet? Here's a quote from Mary Tyler Moore. Take chances, make mistakes. That's how you grow. Pain nourishes your courage. You have to fail in order to practice being brave. Here are my thoughts. Pain as a teacher. I know, I know. Don't you hate when people tell you that? Don't you hate that it actually might be true? But it is incredible how pain can give you clarity of what really matters. About who you really are. And what you're really made of. Have you ever connected pain with bravery? Think of a situation in your life where you recognize the connection between the two. And what did you learn from that scenario? And what could you bring from that scenario that would help you in whatever you're facing today? Today's activity from the book called The Art of Noticing by Rob Walker, 131 Ways to Spark Creativity, Find Inspiration, and Discover Joy in the Everyday. This exercise is called Study Everything Except the Art. A museum is a space carefully designed to direct your attention. You are meant to look at what is on display, the art, the historical artifact, the scientific specimens, whatever, and any related wall text or supporting information. The lighting, the layout, and everything else encourage you to notice precisely what the curators have set before you. Nothing more. I wonder sometimes if the structured formality of the museum-going experience leads to the curiously sheep-like or even disengaged behavior that's routine among certain patrons. If you've ever been to a museum that houses a particularly iconic work, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa at the Louvre, Rembrandt's The Night Watch in Amsterdam, you know exactly what I mean. Everyone is so busy snapping pictures of these works by means of their phone or other device that nothing or nobody seems to be looking at them at all. Looking at them. Looking. And meanwhile, of course, the building is filled with other significant but less famous works that could be contemplated at length without a mosh pit. 
Some museum goers take this one step further by focusing mostly on snapping selfies and documenting their proximity to great works they're not even paying attention to. If treating the museum as a backdrop has become almost a parody, see me sort of seeing what I'm supposed to see, then maybe the more productive strategy is to pay attention to something else, anything else. Next time you're at a museum of any kind, then, devote some time to studying what is not on display. Number one, consider the guards, what they're wearing, their expressions, what they're looking at. Imagine their relationship to the work on display. Don't make assumptions and don't bother them. You'd be surprised how many journalistic and photographic projects have focused on museum guards. Just think about them. Number two, pay attention to the names of the donors. In almost any museum, you will encounter various well panel, wall panel displays thanking specific donors and patrons, as well as the names given to individual galleries and halls within the museum. Research these people. Number three, study the behavior of other museum goers. Photographer Stefan Draschen is an inspiration on this front. He spends quite a bit of time in museums observing and documenting other people, and somewhat secondarily, their relationship to displayed works. One series is called People Touching Artworks, an activity that is almost always verbatim, but turns out to be a fairly commonplace thing, just the same. Another series collects images of people sleeping in museums. Yet another people matching artworks can, captures patrons in outfits that pair eerily well with the paintings they're looking at or walking past. Start by stealing these categories and then invent your own. Let's look at a couple more of the myths around drawing that many of us may have grown up with or maybe think but don't realize we're thinking it or where uh, these thoughts or ideas have come from. And this is inspired by a book called Drawing with Children from Mona Brooks. Myth number six, the first five were categorically dismissed if you will, in prior podcasts. Make sure and check them out. Number six, people who can't draw realistically with accurate shading and correct proportion aren't real artists. Just mentioning Picasso's name seems to remind everyone of the inaccuracy of this statement. Many people don't even know that he was an accomplished realist in his early years. They are not aware that an artist can be equally proficient in many styles, but simply prefer one over the other. It is my hope that we will drop our need from comparative judgment and learn that any approach to art is valid. However, if people are dissatisfied with their ability to draw realistically, they should understand that drawing is a teachable subject. And with practice and study, they can achieve success. Myth number seven, real artists draw from their imaginations and don't need to copy things. When it comes to drawing the endless number of creatures or subjects in nature, or the thousands of man-made objects in the environment, artists who work in realism often have extensive files of reference materials and pictures to remind themselves of the shape and structure of what they wish to draw. Sometimes they observe the object itself but even then, they take photographs of it so they can continue working on the drawing later. They make sketches from other drawings and photographs, rearrange things, add ideas from their imagination, and create what is considered an original piece of artwork. 
Any realistic artist who implies their work, they work solely from their imagination are not telling you the whole story. We need to stop mystifying the drawing process and explain to students and explain to ourselves how artists or actually achieve the results they do. For instance, Picasso and Michelangelo both copied other artists' works for at least two years as part of their initial art training. When Picasso began to express himself in what was considered unique styles, he was actually copying many of his images from African masks. Painters such as Degas worked for from photographs of their subjects and many famous painters have used each other's paintings for inspiration. Imagination always plays a part in the process. It is not a separate function existing independently from the visual data. Integration of observation and imagination is what is needed. Again, both are necessary rather than one taking precedence over the other. And the eighth myth that we'll explore, real artists are pleased with most of what they produce. Like the rest of us, professional artists are often dissatisfied with their work. Knowing this, we ought to give ourselves and the children we work with the freedom to be dissatisfied and to learn from experience. I can honestly say that this is something that I um, have experienced as a teacher in the classroom. And, oh, it's so heartbreaking sometimes that even as young as kindergarten, where you see a child who is such a perfectionist, you know, I, um, I get a pretty good amount of time in the, in the, um, in the art room with the kids. Um, there was a time I only had 30 minutes, but this past year, my time was bumped up to 45 minutes, which is pretty, pretty, pretty good amount of time. Um, to get something accomplished. Um, the older grades, of course, we usually have two, three class sessions to get a project uh, completed. But for the younger grades, you can probably, at about the 40, 35, 40 minute mark, they usually tap out anyway. But it never fails. There'll usually be one or two um, artists in those younger grades, especially that is so hard on themselves. And... Um, I do have a rule in the classroom that you can't, um, you don't get another sheet of paper. And this is laid out from the very beginning of school. And, you know, think of what you will about this idea. But I think if I have laid it out at the beginning of the school year that we don't get second pieces of paper, it really um, minimizes <laughs> those artists that love to start over and love to get really like so hung up on um, what their project looks like and how it has to be just right. Um, I talk about the invention of the eraser and how it's a brilliant invention. I talk about placement of the pencil and, and how we use our pencil and how we don't commit mm -hmm. to lines, um, but we sketch and those things kind of alleviate um, some of the pressure that you might think would be happening in a classroom. But again, there's always at least one or two that tear gets a little bit tearful. And um, I just honor that as part of their process. I honor it. Um, and I do also say, because I definitely feel this with my own artwork, that sometimes you need to just put it away, look at it again next week or whatever our next class time is together. Um, it's funny because um, I pulled out some art journals that I did close to 11, 12 years ago now. And I remember when I was doing them, it was more about, well, it was very much um, a healing uh, process for me to create these art journals but I remember just not really thinking very much of them. Just I wanted to work with something artistically and I did it. Um, but looking at them now, it's just so profound how art and creative outlets like writing and journaling 
really does um, help you see yourself um, in a way that you can, I don't know, have a little more grace, maybe a little more mercy, uh, maybe a little more clarity and awareness of what's going on. So if you've not done something like this before, um, I would invite you to see if you would um, enjoy the opportunity to not just draw, but to add some writing to it as well. an essay from Henry Nowen from his book, uh, Spiritual Direction. And the topic is unceasing prayer. And this is part two uh, in our um, vignette, What is Prayer? To the Christians in Thessalonica, Paul writes, always be joyful, pray constantly, and for all things give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. Paul not only encourages unceasing prayer, but also practices it. We continually thank God for you, he says to his community in Greece. We also pray continually that our God will make you worthy of his call. To the Romans, he writes, I continually mention you in my prayers. And he confronts his friend Timothy, excuse me, he comforts his friend Timothy with the words, I remember you in my prayers constantly, night and day. The two Greek terms that appear repeatedly in Paul's letters are pantote and adialeptus, which means always and without interruption. These words make it clear that for Paul, prayer is not a part of living, but all of life. Not a part of his thought, but all of his thought. Not a part of his emotions and feelings, but all of them. Paul's fervor allows no place for partial commitments, piecemeal giving, or hesitant generosity. He gives all and asks all. This radicalism obviously raises some difficult questions. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? How can we live life with its many demands and obligations as an uninterrupted prayer? What about the endless row of distractions that intrude day after day? Moreover, how can sleep, needed moments of diversion, and the few hours in which we try to escape from the tensions and conflicts of life be lifted up into unceasing prayer? These questions are real and have puzzled many Christians who want to take seriously Paul's exhortation to pray without ceasing. One of the best-known examples of the desire for unceasing prayer is the 19th century Russian peasant who wanted so much to be obedient to Paul's call for uninterrupted prayer that he went from hermit to hermit looking for an answer until he finally found a holy man who taught him the Jesus prayer. He told the peasant to say thousands of times each day, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And in this way, the Jesus prayer slowly became united with his breathing and heartbeat so that he could travel through Russian Russia carrying his knapsack with the Bible, with an ancient uh, uh, anthology of Eastern Christian mystical writings, and some bread and salt living a life of unceasing prayer. Although we are not 19th century Russian peasants or pilgrims, we share the quest of the simple pilgrim, how to pray without ceasing. I want to answer this question not in the context of the wide, silent Russian prairies of a century ago, but in the context of the restlessness of our contemporary Western society. I suggest that the practice of unceasing prayer is a threefold process. We first cry out to God with all our needs and requests. We then turn our unceasing thoughts into continual conversation with God. 
Finally, we learn to listen to God in our hearts through a daily discipline of meditation and complative, contemplative practice. We'll go a little bit more further into prayer over the next couple of podcast segments. I will say for myself personally, this definitely has been such a journey. Um, you know, from saying all the words uh, to saying not a lot of words to this um, idea of prayerfulness, which we discussed in the last podcast. I think for me, it has been something where I've chosen not to get hung up on saying all the words. And what if I forget about someone and and those types of things? Um, There's different types of prayers outside of the Christian faith, if you will, um, that really help with us and with this and make it not so much about this particular person in this moment, though that does, that is a necessary prayer um, concept, right? You're, You're standing in front of someone they are hurting and you want to um, verbally um, bring um, the spirit of God in the midst of the, of the conversation. But I think it's more spiritual than we realize. And what I mean by that is it is not so action oriented as we think that the presence of God that is within all of us is connecting with each one of us all the time. And so when we are together, two or three gathering in his name, he is there. And so while we might constantly be desiring for a more tangible definition of prayer, It's the mystery of prayer and how it, quote, works that I think is the point. That the desire is there to pray, even if the words we don't, we don't necessarily know how to bring them um, to the forefront of our minds. That is why this desire to make the mind the highest form of who we are in humanity The older I get, the more I realize that that's not necessarily so. The mind, the heart, the soul working together, now that's an interesting conversation to have.